Okay, hello everyone. Uh, people are joining the webinar, but we have called this for 10 a.m. Mountain, 12 p.m. Eastern. So we want to get started because we have um, a full program scheduled. We want to keep things on time. So welcome to everybody who doesn't know me. My name is Joanna Barron. I am executive director of the Canadian Constitution Foundation, which as you know, um, is a legal charity that defends fundamental freedoms in courts of law and public opinion. And we're so happy to welcome um, you all to our first town hall of 2023. Um, and really our intention for the next hour is to talk about some of the issues that we heard from you, that you were the most engaged in, the areas of constitutional liberties that you're the most concerned about. Um, and I think you'll find we certainly found some of what we heard from you in our New Year's survey to be very interesting, at times surprising, um, and then to go from those areas that we learned that you're the most interested in, to go into some of those topics and give you the information um, that we've learned and some updates on some of our most important cases, including the Emergencies Act, um, the state of free speech, which, spoiler alert, is most of concern to our community. Um, and finally, to announce a very exciting initiative that for the first time we're offering a private insiders community for all donors to the CCF. And there'll be some exclusive access, exclusive content, exclusive early access to new courses um, for anybody who donates to the CCF in any capacity. So we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, but you can certainly, as we go through the program today, if you have questions or comments, you can put them in the chat. They will come to myself, Christine Van Gyne, who's our litigation director, who's on the call, as well as Russell, Russell Phillips um, out in Calgary, who's our communications director, who's on the call. And we will have a dedicated period for Q&A where we'll answer as many of your questions as we can. So just to give you a rundown, um, I'm going to present the results, or I would say the highlights of the results of our New Year survey, um, which many of you completed. And then I'm going to go a little bit deeper into a discussion of the state of free speech. Um, then we're going to go into an update on the Emergencies Act, which we know many, many, many of you are very concerned about. And we certainly share your concern and give you an update on the litigation and our takeaways from the Rouleau report. Um, we'll talk about a few other areas that CCF is working in. Um, and then we'll go into Q&A. Um, and then we'll again uh, invite you to become a donor and become a member of our, a founding member of our Freedom Insiders private community. Um, so first, let's go into the poll results. So just bear with me a second while I share my screen. Okay, so as you can see, this was a pretty lengthy survey, and we were really pleased that um, over 2,000 people completed it in full. Uh, it took them almost 20 minutes to complete. Um, so thank you very much. If you were one of the 2,041 people who completed uh, our online survey, it really, really helps us. We basically see ourselves as Freedom's Defense Team as representing you, representing all Canadian citizens and sort of residents who enjoy charter protections. So it's really important to us to hear from you about the issues that are most animating to you. So I'm just going to go through, obviously, not the whole survey. That would be really boring, but just the parts that us at the CCF, we found the most interesting and high-level takeaways. So over 94% of you felt that Canada has become less free since 2019. So, of course, since the pandemic, um, 2.67 responded more free. Um, and I can imagine there are many reasons for that. Um, what we saw with the Emergencies Act being invoked and subsequently Christine is gonna talk about what Justice Rouleau ended up concluding about that. I would say uh, arguably makes it much easier to declare a national state of emergency in Canada. But again, Christine will go into that. The vaccine passports, the widespread lockdowns um, and really the degree of overall judicial deference that we saw. So we agree as well, um, but we also don't think that there's nothing that we can do about that. Um, but this was just such a resounding consensus that our country has become less free. The good news is though, that people are much more aware of that, I would say. 
Okay, this was really interesting to us, and I don't think I would have um, predicted this, that when we asked the question, which constitutional rights do you think are most threatened in Canada right now, that overwhelmingly, as you can see, 55% of you said free expression. So free speech, um, very threatened in Canada. And I'm going to talk about that and some of the work that we're doing and what I would say is sort of the arenas, the areas in which free expression is most are most threatened in Canada right now, because there are many aspects, right, to the online regulation, to regulation of professional regulatory bodies, um, but there is some good news. So little, little um, heads up that there is a bit of a silver lining. Uh, the second uh, constitutional right that you were most concerned about was security of the person, 18.1%. Um, so that's section seven right? Life, liberty, and security of the person, um, which can uh, encompass many different areas of life. So for example, our challenge to the regime of the quarantine hotels, which unfortunately was uh, struck down or dismissed by the judge. Um, we had a section seven argument that it's just inherently violates our section seven right to life, liberty, and security of the person to be essentially detained involuntarily for traveling, including traveling to take care of a sick parent. Um, but obviously many different areas of life can be encompassed by that. So, um, so not as surprising that a lot of people found that security of the person was engaged. Uh, and the others were kind of all over the place, but definitely, oh, and there's, a, there's an asterisk here that that includes medical choices, uh, choices around vaccination, um, medical assistance in dying that would fit under the aegis of section seven, but overwhelming concern for free expression. Okay, uh, and we saw similarly, which makes sense, the types of legal cases that are most important to you, free expression and security of the person and CCF does have active litigation in both of those areas, which we'll, we'll talk about as well. Uh, and this was an interesting one to us that the question was whether the pandemic would have lasting effects on our culture of civil liberties. Um, and 80% said many long lasting effects. And I think this can go both ways because certainly with the CCF, we have seen over the last year, over the last few years, but especially over the last year, there's been um, a galvanization and a lot more interest in the fact that you do have constitutional rights and there are sort of, in theory, guardrails against what government can do. You do have recourse. And we do think that generally Canadians have become much more awake to that because we just never expected that we would have to show, you know, a private medical record to go into a restaurant or to go into a medical theater, sorry, a movie theater. Pardon that. It's it is a bit of a medical theater in, in that sense. Like the, at the beginning of the pandemic, even those things were inconceivable. And so I think a lot of us were just shocked to see the extent to which government could go in and intrude into our lives. And really, when you see you know the cases, many of the cases that have been fought with pretty skimpy evidence for the necessity. Um, so. Certainly, I would say there is a way to read this that it will have a positive effect on Canada's culture of civil, civil liberties in the sense that there's much more awareness now. So as we said, you're the most concerned about freedom of expression um, and 40% said it's not well protected. So not entirely surprising. 0.9% said it was well protected. I don't know about that. Uh, this was interesting. I, I actually don't know if I agree with this, but I certainly understand the reasoning that the level of government that uh, poses the greatest that threat to freedom of expression was the federal government. Now, I think the reason for that is that a lot of people are very aware of the various um, online harms bills, Bill C-11, which is regulating um, social media platforms and you know, basically regulating user-generated content online. Um, and those are certainly initiatives of the federal government. And they certainly do present a severe threat to freedom of expression. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you guys afterwards about 
some of the other arenas in which freedom of expression is really threatened right now. And I think you'll agree that it's certainly not just the federal government. There are municipalities that are taking actions that are very menacing to freedom of expression. There are provincial uh, affairs. Um, so it's not just the federal government. So I don't know if 90, 95% is quite justified, um, but it's good to know that people are certainly most aware of the various federal legislative initiatives that touch on freedom of expression. So to this point, uh, we have a new case that is about the extent to which professional bodies, so in this case, it's the College of Psychologists um, and how they restrict the speech of, of their members. So some strong concern about that, 64%. Um, and of course, we saw over the course of the pandemic, uh, colleges of physicians were extremely draconian in forbidding their members. So any physician in Ontario or a member of the College of Physicians was banned from speaking out against lockdowns and school closures, even though those things seemed well within the ambit of reasonable debate. Um, and so a professional regulator is not the government, but they are empowered by a statute. That's how they, be, they are self-governing bodies. So they certainly, when they take actions like this, they are subject to the charter. Uh, and this is what I've spoken about before. So this is, um, why we assume the reason is that you're most concerned about federal government activities. So this is referring to um, was called Bill C-10, current incarnation is called C-11. So this is the um, regulation or the law to update the Broadcasting Act and allow the CRTC give it basically the scope to regulate the entire internet, including user generated content. So very strong concern about this proposed legislation which looks like it's going ahead. It was reintroduced in the House and is currently um, under review by the Senate. Okay, this one was, I would say, the most surprising to us, to myself and the team, that there's a lot of division around. So Section 33 is, I would say, the area of the charter where our community is the most split. And it makes sense to me, to be honest. So Section 33 for those of you who aren't aware, who aren't constitutional law nerds, is the so-called notwithstanding clause, um, where a government can pass a law which temporarily, not permanently, for a period of five years, and then it has to be renewed, which applies despite notwithstanding the application of the charter. So it in, in a sense is a government saying, we know that this might be un unconstitutional, but it's very important to us for a reason we'll articulate. And so we, we're going to go ahead with it anyway. So famously, Quebec um, has uniformly sort of just tacked on Section 33 for its own reasons. But over the last few years, we have seen other governments. Ontario uh, threatened to use it in the famous Toronto City Council case, um, where uh, the Ford government decided to reduce the number of wards in Toronto. It turned out they didn't have to use it because that was not an action that was protected by the charter in any event. Um, and they also have uh, have used it in, in the teacher's strike matter very controversially in Saskatchewan. There was a case concerning Catholic schools where this, the notwithstanding clause was invoked. So you could say it's coming a little bit into vogue. And so look, there's arguments for people who care about liberty. There's arguments on both sides of this. On the pro section 33 side, you could say, well, it's in the tradition of parliamentary supremacy, and we don't want judges to have all this power, right? Like we've certainly, I think, seen in this country, uh, particularly over the pandemic, but even before then, um, certainly I would say since 2014, 2015, when the Supreme Court started to get very muscular in overturning its own interpretations, um, that it's sort of balancing to have um, have the right of the legislature to put forward their own interpretations of what is constitutional or what are what are the priorities. On the other hand, sometimes it's used in ways that we really don't like, right? To, for example, in Quebec, uh, and this is just uh, my personal position, where Quebec has pa passed Bill 21, which forbids people from wearing, you know, symbols, religious ornaments in public. So uh, a woman who wears a hijab cannot be a Quebec public school teacher. I think as you, when you live in a free multicultural society, that's an unconstitutional interference with freedom of religion. Um, and so we have to accept that if we're going to uh, allow the use of Section 33, it's going to be used in ways that we won't like, 
And because section 33 applies, there won't necessarily be a judicial remedy. So all of which is to say, we see both sides and we understand why um, freedom's defense community is split around that. Okay, so this was another one where there was not surprisingly overwhelming consensus that you guys strongly oppose the federal government's use of the Emergencies Act. Um, so I'm gonna not really make any comments about that because Christine is gonna talk a bit about that, but this was just probably the most resounding uh, consensus of any matter that uh, the Emergencies Act was improperly invoked in February of 2022. And yes, we do have this report, but this is still very much a live issue and we will be seeking um, a binding judicial determination about the constitutionality of the invocation of the act. This was an interesting, uh, I suppose even more consensus than the Emergencies Act. 93% of you concluded that the federal and provincial governments don't stick to areas of their own jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, under the constitutional division of powers, there are areas delegated to the provinces, areas dedicated to the feds, um, and we certainly have seen, I, we didn't ask which government we, you think is intruding into which government's level, um, but certainly, in my opinion, the federal government power has continued to grow and increase and have that be ratified, particularly by the Supreme Court, um, for example, in the carbon tax reference, um, where they greatly broadly expanded a pretty you know, vague area of, of federal jurisdiction, which allows them to do a lot in terms of regulating areas which really touch on property and civil rights, which are provincial areas of jurisdiction. So we've seen a lot of creep here. And it was interesting to see that you guys are very attuned to that. So case in point, and this is a case that we'll have coming up, it's going to be heard this month. Um, the Alberta Court of Appeal struck down the Federal Impact Assessment Act, which is colloquially known as the No More Pipelines Bill, um, saying that it was an unjustified, unconstitutional intrusion into an area of provincial jurisdiction. So that kind of jostles a little bit uncomfortably with the carbon tax reference, although there are um, differences and uh, you guys strongly supported this decision. So this is coming up before the Supreme Court this month. CCF is participating as an intervener um, where we will make submissions that will try and effectively scale back some of the expansion of what is called the POG, Peace, Order, and Good Government power. Sounds very vague. It is very vague, and courts have allowed this to basically allow this growth of the federal power, including to intrude in areas where we say are traditionally provincial jurisdiction. So this is kind of um, an int longstanding interest of the CCFs. It turns out that there's not really a good reason why property rights were not included in the charter. It was, uh, it was the position of the Pierre Trudeau government. It was negotiated and basically just because of last minute concessions on various sides. They didn't end up being guaranteed in the charter. And uh, one of our colleagues, Malcolm Lavoie, made the interesting point that something like the freezing of bank accounts without a court warrant would be very difficult, which we saw, of course, in February 2022, would be very difficult to do if there was a guarantee to property rights in the charter. So there are real practical ramifications of something like this. So 97% of you um, think that property rights should be guaranteed in the charter. So we might be getting close to the threshold for a constitutional amendment. So thank you again to everybody who filled out this survey. We really appreciate it. We're gonna run one every year. Um, we know that it takes a bit of time, but we really look at this and discuss this and really take it into account in our case selection process. Um, and just one last plug, I mentioned this at the beginning, um, but we are going to be launching right as of the end of this call, our private donors community, Freedom Insiders. So going forward, these town halls where we'll have Q&A, where we'll present sort of exclusive information will only be for our donors in any amount. You'll also have the opportunity to submit questions um, to be selected by Christine Van Gein and I every month, and we'll record sort of like a private podcast um, responding to a selection of your questions, um, any ebooks or e-courses that we release, 
you'll get first access to, um, and there will be other benefits being announced soon. So any donation, any amount will get you into this donors community, and uh, we really hope that you join us. Okay, I'm going to stop this share. Okay, so I just wanted to make a few comments about uh, the state of free expression in Canada, because as we saw, this is the area of greatest concern of our donors. And we're very interested and concerned about it as well. Free expression is the sort of master value in a society. We can't sort out what our values are, and we certainly can't, you know, resolve any conflicts if we can't have open discourse. So I'll start with a bit of good news, a silver lining um, from a year ago, um, which I think was one of the most important cases on free expression in the last 10 years from the Supreme Court of Canada. And it was a very positive precedent. So you may or may not be aware of the Mike Ward versus Quebec case. So Mike Ward was a comedian in the Montreal area who made, frankly, a very distasteful, quite offensive joke about a disabled child. However, as a consequence of that joke, he was fined $42,000 by the Human Rights Tribunal. Um, and there's just a lot of danger when you have something like an unelected bureaucrat who also represents the state going in and policing, you know, on far from the context in a transcript, what the limits of comedy are. And comedy can be offensive and you can critique it. You can refuse to support the comedian, but when the government gets involved, there's a really dangerous precedent being set. So in that case, the CCF, we intervened at the Supreme Court of Canada, and we argued that, just as I said, empowering government to censor comedy through fines is a curtailment of freedom of expression, which is unacceptable, and that um, under the Quebec Charter, where there's a right to human dignity, um, that that right has to be balanced by the underlying democratic value, the underlying value of free expression for all of society. And actually, that's what the majority found. And they overturned the fine. They said that it was not in accordance with the guarantee of free expression. And we actually think that that's going to be a very important precedent, which will apply to every court in Canada, every administrative tribunal, and every law in Canada, that free expression has to be taken into account as an animating under underlying value. Um, so that's the good news. Uh, the Supreme Court has been better on free expression as of late than you may have thought. Okay, let's go on to some of the bad news of which there's quite a bit, unfortunately. So let's talk about these online regulation bills that the current government seems to be uh, such, such a fan of. So first there's the online harms bill, um, which I believe right now is uh, under bill C-36. So this bill is requiring platforms, so Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, to proactively monitor any post, any content that goes up, and they're given a 24-hour takedown requirement to take down anything that looks like it could be hate speech, which has a notoriously very vague definition, right? It's something that provokes feelings of detestation or contempt, um, and so the upshot of this, so they have 24 hours to take down this content. Um, and the upshot is that because the, the penalty are very heavy fines, which could be up to 3% of global revenues or $10 million, whichever is larger, all of these platforms, and we've seen this in other countries that have brought in similar laws like Germany, they will just err on the side of caution and just flag anything that could be seen as edgy. Um, so effectively, it presents a massive chill effect, um, both on the side of users. So if you know that something could be flagged, if it says at all controversial, probably you won't post it. Um, and certainly on the part of platforms, which uh, whether they can afford to be fined 3% of global revenues or not, they certainly would not like to. And it also imp imposes obligations on the platforms to share information about the content that they flag with the crown. Um, and there's uh, was concerns raised at various consultations um, with the platforms that for them, they saw that it could easily be used as a political tactic um, and a general tendency towards censorship. 
So we're monitoring this bill very closely in its progress. Uh, and then there's Bill C-11, which was previously called Bill C-10. So this is the bill to update the Broadcasting Act um, to apply to the whole internet, um, essentially would impose obligations on platforms to tweak the algorithm so that a certain amount of Canadian content, which would of course be determined by the government, what constitutes Canadian content, as well as regulate user generated content, so this bill is really a solution in search of a problem. We know that disproportionately Canadian creators actually perform outperform based on our, our numbers. Um, and it just imposes this, uh, this obligation on the CRTC to determine which content it wants you to see rather than the content that you have you have demonstrated you're interested in. So that's currently been, that's been reintroduced and is going to the Senate for review. And we're also monitoring that and also in, um, <clears throat> in touch with various platforms about what their position is, because of course this will affect them directly. Okay, uh, this is our latest case. I don't know if we've officially, officially announced it. I believe we have, um, but this is the Jordan Peterson matter. So Jordan Peterson, of course, who, is a YouTuber, a podcaster, but also um, a licensed psychologist in Ontario. He uh, had a complaint lodged against him for various tweets, which I don't really take, we don't really take any position on the content. Some of them were pretty annoying, but certainly nothing to do with the practice of psychology, various, various sort of grumpy, grouchy tweets. Um, so a complaint was lodged against him that they were demeaning to the practice of psychology. Now, interestingly, there was a very similar complaint lodged against Dr. Peterson, I think back in 2019, and there was a decision rendered on it in 2020, which said basically, yes, these tweets are a bit, uh, a bit uh, flamboyant and strongly worded, but they don't relate to the practice of psychology and we believe in the value of free speech. So they issued a recommendation that he make his comments in a respectful tone and basically left it. Now this time things seem to be going further. The college has already required that Dr. Peterson submit to mandatory coaching um, for his tweets. And so the CCF will be intervening in this matter, which will be a judicial review. And our position is that where charter right, like the right to free expression is engaged, um, that right has to be paramount. And the decision maker, like a college of psychologists administrator can't get into regulating off-duty conduct. Of course, we all know if you're a doctor or I'm a lawyer that there are certain, you know, there are certain standards that you have to agree to as part of your professional regulator, regulator. but that doesn't extend to when you tweet about a Sports Illustrated model as much as we might not enjoy those tweets. It clearly does not touch on the practice of psychology. And our position will be, which will make that no professional regulator should be engaging in the regulation of off-duty conduct, but especially when it engages the charter. And these are the areas where we really see our right to free expression, just as individuals getting impacted. There are millions of people in the province of Ontario that are fall under a professional regulator. And if the, this precedent says that you can never tweet anything that might be edgy. You can see how that could be a huge problem. Not for Jordan Peterson, who will be fine, who you know at this point is one of the most successful content creators in the world. But for everybody else, we wanna hear what psychologists and doctors and lawyers have to say. They have a right to participate in the public square. Uh, so if you have any questions about that case, we're happy to answer them later. And I noticed that I've been talking for a while, so I'm going to conclude my comments on free speech there and pass it over to Christine to talk about the Emergencies Act. Okay, thanks, 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 Joanna, and thanks everybody who signed up to come to this town hall. Uh, just a reminder that we have a Q and A box at the bottom, so if you click on that Q and A box, you can send in a question and we can answer it at uh, at the end. Whether it's about freedom of expression, which Joanna just talked about, our poll results letting us know what priorities you think that you would like to see our organization take on in 2023 or about the Emergencies Act, which I'm gonna talk about now. So as I'm sure all of you know who signed up for this, the uh, Rouleau inquiry released their final report 
uh, on February 17th, so just over a week ago, a week and a bit ago. Uh, this was obviously the public inquiry into the Trudeau government's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act in response to the Freedom Convoy. This is an extraordinary piece of legislation that has never been used before. And when the report came out, we, I mean, I have some complaints about how it came out because we were not given the same access to the report that media was. Media, even though we were a party to the inquiry uh, and we participated in it and we cross-examined the prime minister, we got the report at the same time as the public and the media was given early access. Uh, the media had given, uh, was given a lockup, which meant they could not distribute the document before the document was public. And of course, we would have agreed to the same terms, but we were still not given access. So uh, some complaints about that process. Uh, but, you know, when it was public, we immediately looked over it. Uh, we responded with our statement because the report, the inquiry report was really disappointing. And look, I know Commissioner Rouleau had a really hard job. This was produced on a very tight timeline following six weeks of sitting uh, and then a uh, a week of roundtables about policy uh, changes to the Emergencies Act. And the report itself is over 2,000 pages when you include all of the uh, exhibits and, and appendices. But frankly, this report is, is just an exercise in deference to the government. The real crux of what happened in this re report was uh, the conclusion that Cabinet was justified in invoking the Emergencies Act on February 14th. The commissioner said there was credible and compelling evidence supporting both a subjective and objective reasonable belief in the existence of a public order emergency, which of course is a defined term. And I'll get into the definition of that term and the criteria for, for what it is and why that conclusion is so wrong. So the commissioner concluded by saying the decision to invoke the act was appropriate. This is very cautious. The commissioner said a reasonable person could reasonably reach a different conclusion. And our hope is that the court will, because we are not letting this be the final word on the Emergencies Act. We have brought a separate court challenge in federal court. Uh, we're looking for a judicial review, uh, not of the inquiry report, because the inquiry report is not binding. It is not any type of administrative decision, but we're looking for a review of cabinet's decision to invoke the prime minister's decision to invoke. And we have a hearing in that matter scheduled for April 3rd to 5th. And just as I did for the, uh, the, the commission, the Public Order Emergency Commission, I, I'm going to go to Ottawa. I'm going to be there for all of the hearings. And following those long days, I'm going to go back to my hotel room and do live streams summarizing what happened in uh, the day of hearings. Uh, because I know that that was something that people who subscribe to our YouTube channel, people who subscribe to our freedom updates and who are generally supporters of the work that we do fighting for fundamental freedoms in Canada. I got a lot of really positive feedback about doing live stream summaries of what happened because of course, everyone's very interested in this topic, but everyone who supports us also they're hard work. You're all hardworking people. You can't just monitor what's happening in a court case all day or public order emergency commission for six weeks. So back to the Rouleau report, I, there was virtually no substantive basis in our view upon which cabinet could have concluded that the circumstances in Ottawa met the threshold for invoking the act. I sat through all of those hearings. I watched every single day the the government did not make its case and i cannot fathom how the commissioner accepted this hail mary argument from the government this this was this argue, this legal argument about the definition of a public order emergency specifically to declare public order emergency there needs to be a threat to the security of canada and that is a defined term defined through reference to another piece of legislation called the CSIS Act. And CSIS, uh, the uh, like the spot Canada spy agency and intelligence agency, they found there was no threat to the security of, of Canada. The RCMP commissioner found that 
other legal tools had not been exhausted before the Emergencies Act was invoked. So to, to, for the government to argue threat to the security of Canada, you know, CSIS's assessment is irrelevant. We don't need to do our own separate threat assessment. Cabinet, who's much further removed from the situation, can reach a different conclusion from the people who are actually on the ground who work in policing and intelligence and say there is no national security threat. They, I mean, they tried. That's a novel interpretation. It goes against the principles of statutory interpretation to say, you know, the even though it's incorporated by reference, the definition is still different. They tried and and they they were successful with this judge, with Commissioner Rouleau. I am not confident that that argument, that crazy argument is going to work with a, a federal court judge. So we are making arguments in federal court that that interpretation is wrong. Uh, just back on the Rouleau report, some of the other things that he found I did I did agree with he taught he was very critical of the Ottawa Police Services in general and of Chief Slowly in particular. He talked about you know breakdowns in communication, the failure of a coordinated command system. He talked about how the police were not even reading their the intelligence reports that were being sent to them. This is all fair game. I mean the the RCMP commissioner resigned. I think no one is surprised that she that Brenda Lucky resigned just before this report came out. And of course, Peter Slowly, the chief of police in Ottawa, resigned in the middle of all of this happening. So I don't think anyone is surprised that he was critical of these these uh, these policing failures. He was also very critical of the Ontario government, saying that they basically abandoned uh, Ottawa. Take that for for what you will, uh, but really the problem I I have with this is the acceptance of this bizarre argument the government made that the words in the act don't mean what they say they mean. They I mean the words on in a piece of legislation mean what what they say, and to reach a different conclusion is frankly uh, bizarre, and it also creates a huge problem in the precedent. I mean, this is not a binding precedent. The Rouleau inquiry is not a binding precedent. But if governments see this as a kind of green light to use the Emergencies Act for future cases, even if you did not support the cause of the Freedom Convoy, and we all have different opinions about that. I personally had some sympathies for the frustrations that were being expressed in the convoy. Not everyone has to agree with me. Um, I also had took issue with with some of the conduct in in the protest, but it actually doesn't even matter what your view on the convoy is. What what matters was the use of this law was illegal. And if there's another protest that happens that you do agree with, if you disagreed with this one, what if there's a protest that you do agree with? And the government uses this extraordinary law that allows them to create new criminal laws by executive order. Like the cabinet can just enact new criminal law like that. And if that power is used, think about how that power could be used against a cause that you support if you didn't support this particular cause. Uh, it's basically a green light. And what we what we want to do at federal court is have a red light, a binding red light on the government because this decision, uh, this decision was not, is not binding. The Rouleau finding is not binding. It's not a finding of liability. It's not a finding uh, of any binding precedential way. And the one thing I'll, I'll close on and add about what we're going to be arguing in federal court is we're spending a lot of time dealing with the frozen accounts. Frozen accounts was a huge problem in a uh, was one of the things that the government did when they enacted the Emergencies Act. They created these new um, procedures where banks were required to freeze assets that were for people who were either participating in the protests or supporting the protests. And we spend a lot of time talking about the, the concerns that we have around that. The testimony that came out in the in inquiry was shocking about how joint bank accounts were frozen 
people couldn't people who owed child support to an ex-spouse were not able to make their their child support payments they were not able to pay mortgage payments they were not able to pay business loans or separate not not personal accounts like their business accounts could be frozen and they were not able to make uh payments for their business and some of these were were trucking businesses um and and that has long-term credit implications and this if it was used illegally which we think it it was is it it, it implicates your right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure because this is you know a search or seizure and all of that information was also sent to rcmp and to CSIS. so we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about the frozen accounts in particular when we go to federal court and a topic that i know a lot of you are super interested in and of course so are we so uh, that's it for the Emergencies Act. Uh, April 3rd to 5th, we're going to be in Ottawa making arguments and I'm going to have live streams for all of you. I'm looking forward to it a lot. Okay, great. Christine, do you want to make a few comments just briefly about federalism? Because we saw that there are a high proportion of people in our community who are concerned about overstepping federal boundaries of power and any any announcements about that? Oh, and the other thing I wanted to announce, by the way, I should have uh, wrapped it up when I was talking about free expression, is that we are actually planning on putting together a second free online course. So there already is a free online course on constitutional law. Russell, could you put that uh, link in the chat for the free constitutional law course? So we're going to put out probably by this summer, a second uh, complimentary course just on free expression, just on the various dimensions and important cases on free expression. And again, if you're a member of Freedom Insiders community, which is you donate to us in any amount uh, ever, basically, um, you'll get preferential access to that. You'll even be a bit of a beta tester where you'll be able to go through the course, give us feedback so that we can make it even better. Um, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, thanks, Joanna, for reminding me about the course that we already have, because I get asked about um, all the time on YouTube, people will say, oh, you should do a, a, a series of videos about our charter rights and like go through each of the charter rights and tell us about how they work. And we actually have that. So it's at the ccf.ca slash learn. It's a totally free course uh, that is about the fundamentals of constitutional law in Canada. It's not just about charter rights. Uh, it's also about uh, federalism. So let me talk about federalism as well. Um, I am so happy when I saw the results of this poll that we just did of our supporters, that federalism is an important issue for our supporters. Um, I shouldn't be surprised, but I always am. Typically, when Canadians talk about or think about how our courts can enhance liberty, they're thinking about the charter. They're thinking about, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, association. And of course, the charter is incredibly important. Uh, it is an important part of our constitution that guarantees our fundamental freedoms. But of course, the federal structure laid out in the Constitution Act 1867, which includes the division of powers, and all of the decisions related to federalism, that can also enhance our liberties. So we have a free book that we made uh, late last year. It's at the ccf.ca slash freedom through federalism. And you can download that book totally for free. Uh, I think part of the reason people are so interested in federalism is there's some the interesting cases coming up right now. And I think part of it is Danielle Smith, the premier of Alberta. I think part of it is her Alberta Sovereignty Act of telling the federal government she will not enforce federal law and the federal government cannot require a province to enforce federal law. So there's actually a really fascinating case that was just heard in December at the federal court about that. And that is a case, it's a reference case in which the Attorney General of Quebec challenged the constitutionality of portions of what's it's a piece of legislation called an act respecting First Nations Inuit, Métis, children, youth, and families. And this is basically a dispute between the federal and Quebec governments over Indigenous child and family services. And it was heard in December. We were an intervener in that case. And basically it's an interpretation. The, the federal government wants 
the provincial bureaucracy to enforce minimum standards when it comes to indigenous child and welfare uh, family services. And of course, everyone wants wonderful child services for indigenous communities, for all communities. Uh, the dispute here is that Quebec thinks that the, their way of doing it is better and the federal government thinks their way of doing it is better and the federal government is trying to force Quebec to, Quebec's provincial bureaucracy to do it their way. And, you know, if the federal government can direct the executive and public service of a province, it could remove a really important check on power and erode responsible government. Coercion is inconsistent with the value of diversity and experimentation that federalism entails. So, you know, it might be um, Indigenous Child and Family Services today uh, that the government, the federal government wants these minimum standards on, but tomorrow it could be something related to education or healthcare. And we, you know, Quebec jealously guards their provincial jurisdiction. They do not want to be told what to do by the federal government. And we, we this, what's shocking to me is that that particular case did not receive a lot of attention. It kind of, you know, went to the Supreme Court uh, and the, I don't, it didn't get much attention from the media. But Danielle Smith has said something very similar about not uh, enforcing federal law in Alberta. And it received a tremendous amount of attention. So there is, there's a very different treatment of how um, the public imagination is captured by the conduct of Quebec versus Alberta. And the implications of this Supreme Court case, when this decision comes out, and we intervened in, in this case uh, to support Quebec's position, uh, the implications of this Quebec case can have a, could, could impact what happens with the Alberta Sovereignty Act. So I have a YouTube video describing this case uh, that did really well. And I, again, I'm always surprised when people are interested in federal federalism issues. Uh, so you can check out that video if you wanna learn more about the case. Um, another case that we're doing on federalism is about the Trudeau government's No More Pipelines law. That's also known as the Impact Assessment Act. And that, that uh, is being argued at the Supreme Court next week on March 7th. And we are intervening to support Alberta's position. The underlying decision is from May of last year. The Alberta Court of Appeal found that the Impact Assessment Act was unconstitutional. And that decision can have serious and significant implications for Canadian federalism, for the rule of law, uh, investor certainty, and resource development. Now, as you probably know, the Impact Assessment Act was introduced by the federal government in 2019. It's obviously very controversial. It replaced a previous piece of legislation called the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. And it's called the No More Pipelines Law because, you know, even though it doesn't, you know, outright ban pipelines, new pipelines from being developed, in, in practice, it means they're not going to happen. They're not going to get approved. So we are intervening to support Alberta's position. And at a high level, we're going to be arguing about the importance of federalism and the rule of law and against an expansion of the reasoning in another case uh, that you might know as the carbon tax decision. It's the Greenhouse Gas Emission Pricing Act decision. Uh, that case present, created a potentially slippery slope when it comes to national standards and the intrusion by the federal government into provincial jurisdiction. The federal government claims uh, that they have uh, jurisdiction in intra-provincial resource development in this case, so resource development solely within Alberta. And, you know, in the greenhouse gas case, they also claim federal responsibility in an area of provincial jurisdiction related to greenhouse gas emissions. So this case has the potential to rein in some of that reasoning. Uh, and, and we're going to be arguing it next week. I'm really looking forward to to seeing that at the Supreme Court. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Christine. So I'm going to jump in uh, with some questions. You can continue to add questions into the chat, by the way. 
Um, but there's a few that uh, I'll answer some and uh, Christine, if you have any comments or maybe I'll shoot some over to you. So one question was if there's any possibility to appeal the Rouleau Commission's decision. The answer is no, because it's not a judicial decision. It's just a report that's required by the Emergencies Act statute itself. However, as, as you heard us talk about, we do have a formal federal court judicial review that will be heard at the beginning of April. Um, and it's very possible that, and that whatever the decision is, we certainly hope it will be favorable to our position, but that will be appealable. So I wouldn't be surprised if that stayed in litigation for a few years, um, but no, it's not a judicial decision. So there's no possibility to appeal it. Now, this is an interesting question that uh, I've thought about a bunch, and I don't know if Christine has any comments. This is, I think, from Marion. Uh, how about freedom of conscience? This is a vital uh, right which protects individuals from what others think, perceive, and how they feel about one's actions, their belief within the laws. It is listed as the fundamental freedom with religion, and it needs to be protected. So the unfortunate reality is that this right has basically been ignored by the courts and pretty much freedom of religion has been given disproportionate uh, disproportionate attention and the sort of corresponding rights of freedom of assembly and freedom of conscience have very rarely been uh uh, been addressed by the court. Now, it doesn't necessarily always have to be that way. And we work with some amazing scholars like Brian Bird, Chris Kinsinger, our Running Mean Society National Director, who have really persuasively argued that it's time for the court to take a more muscular approach to defending freedom of religion, not just, sorry, freedom of conscience, including, you know, for non-religious people. Like, it's not clear to me why I, as a secular person, my, my right of conscience should be less important than a devout Christian or Muslim or Jews. Um, I don't know if Christine, if you have anything that you want to add about that, but that's just an unfortunate reality. The court just has not been very interested in it. Yeah, I, that's all I would say. It's considered one of our forgotten freedoms. And there are a number of journals that those scholars that you mentioned, as well as um, Dwight Newman from uh, the University of Saskatchewan has written about. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting topic because yes, the, there is really not any jurisprudence on freedom of conscience and belief. It's basically all freedom of religion. And I think that that's a problem because you can still have conscientious beliefs that are not rooted in traditional religious beliefs. Yeah. Okay, this is one I'll just briefly address because we're just aware of this issue. I think this is from Brett. Uh, on the topic of free expression, the BC government recently introduced amendments to their health act. Uh, which include government appointed bureaucrats, the various colleges, as opposed to elections, uh, sorry, elected by the members and punishments can be up to two years in jail for things such as voicing an opinion contrary to the PHO. So I am aware of this. And I think it also the amendment was sort of rammed through without any consultation from the profession. I was shocked when I learned learned about it. Um, and so we we are sort of monitoring it, we would have to have an actual person who is affected by the bill or just for us to consider taking legal action. But certainly Christine can talk a bit about our experience with the BC PHO in our vaccine passport case, which maybe you wanna mention briefly that we our experience has not been good to say the least. <laughs> uh, yes, so we are challenging, or we, we have already challenged and now we are appealing a decision related to medical exemptions in British Columbia for public vaccine passports. That's not employer mandates. It's the government, remember this, we've all tried to forget, but the government banned people who were unvaccinated from entering public spaces. And the government said, oh, you know, we have this process for uh, if you want an exemption. First, they said no exemptions at all. And then they said, uh, we wrote to them and said, this is clearly unconstitutional. You can't have no exemptions at all. And then they were like, okay, we will have exemptions. Uh, and then they made up this like crazy process where you had to apply each time you wanted to go somewhere. You couldn't just get an exemption, even if you had a medical condition that you got from getting vaccinated. Uh, like uh, pericarditis was one of the, the patient, patients that we were working with. She got pericarditis as a result of her vaccine. And they were like, if you want to go to the movies with your friend, you want to go to a restaurant, you apply to the government each time. And the, it, it kind of, and they also excluded all kinds of more rare adverse reactions. One of our other patients had 
a much rarer reaction to the vaccine uh, that caused her partial paralysis in her arm. And uh, she was pregnant, so she didn't want to get a second vaccine. And they were like, well, we've never heard of this adverse reaction. So like, you better get a new one. You better get a second dose, even though she's obviously susceptible to nerve damage and is pregnant and does not want nerve damage that could hurt her baby. So they were, they wouldn't even consider her application. So it just kind of just goes to show that the thinking at public health and public health nurses told this woman to go and get her second dose even though her neurologist told her absolutely not to get a second dose. So it just kind of shows the unreasonableness of the conduct of public health in, in the course of the pandemic. There was like very black and white thinking, not vaccinated, you're evil, even though these people clearly went to go and get vaccinated. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question about Bill C-18, which is the Online News Act. So the question is, does C-18 threaten to instruct internet providers to block, filter, throttle, or in any other way censor anything coming from or going to their users? So my understanding of Bill C-18 is that it more is going to require platforms to reimburse news plot, uh, sorry, like uh, newspapers um, for linking to their content. And the problem with that is that it's not necessarily, it's not really worth it to Twitter or Google or Facebook to compensate the Globe and Mail. Um, so that's why you've seen Google like experimenting with blocking links. However, I would say these other bills, so C-11, the amendment to the Broadcasting Act, it does arguably, I mean, I think this is the elephant in the room, that if we're saying that the CRTC can regulate YouTube to uh, juke its algorithm in a specific way so that I see a feed of approved Canadian content, then by definition, there's going to be an infrastructure that is blocking certain content for me, and that is directing preferential government approved content to me. Um, so it is, you know, arguably that is throttling, it's direct throttling. And furthermore, um, the online harms bill uh, where platforms are being told, look, take down anything that's sort of on the edge or pay up 3% of global revenue, that's also going to be blocking the content that all of us have access to. So I don't actually think Bill C-18 is, uh, Bill C-18 has huge problems, but I think these issues of content being throttled, that's already kind of, uh, that's already on the table, unfortunately. And the cumulative effect of all three is pretty disturbing. So this is from Marion, and I think this kind of, uh, dovetails in with the discussion of the online harms bill, she said, or they said, I have noticed a huge creep in the definition of violence to include anything that makes people feel uncomfortable or offended. I believe this does not represent the legal de de definition. Do I, do you think this is creeping into judicial decisions? Um, so yeah, so I wrote something, um, I think back in the summer about the online harms bill that the elephant in the room is when you have both the situation where we have a society where the definition of violence and harm is becoming broader and broader and more like you offended me, you hurt my feelings, like that's gotten so much more uh, traction among so many circles. And you have an ex bringing back the civil remedy for hate speech, where essentially even apart from the criminal code prohibitions on hate speech, you have a civil remedy that seems wider, it's kind of a recipe for disaster because everybody's confused about what actual harm is. And it seems to be, you know, the term is concept creep. And there's more, there's more consequences for engaging in it. You have a situation where a lot more speech is going to be either chilled um, or potentially fined against. Uh, when you say this appeared to be the decision that Rouleau was leaning towards, I think what you're referring to is that Rouleau kind of, he doesn't end up concluding that there was any actual threat of violence, um, but he does focus on various things like the Coots seizure and certain rhetoric and the possible involvement of Diagalon. And so it was kind of just like this loose threat with the violence in the air that for low was enough to say that cabinet was reasonably justified in invoking the emergencies act, um, which we also very much disagree with. That is not the standard. That's maybe like cops have the right to take the investigative actions or the enforcement actions they feel they need to take if they think something violent might happen, but the federal cabinet certainly doesn't. So I agree with you that it was way too playing fast and loose with the definition of actual violence, but that's a bit of a separate matter. Um, okay, this is an important question that we 
I'm interested that we are still getting it, but I'll let Christine address this. Just a comment to perhaps clarify the high de degree of concern for federal powers for freezing bank accounts of those who express their support by contributing money to the cause, to a cause. This is the biggest fear I consider before offering money to a contentious cause. This is from Ellen, pardon me. Okay, so it's, I don't think that we are a contentious cause first. <laughs> We are a registered charity that fights for fundamental freedoms in Canada. We are a regular intervener in the uh, Supreme Court and in courts of appeal across Canada. We are lawyers who work with senior members of the bar who are very respected at large national firms. So uh, the work that we do is very, uh, you know, you get a tax receipt when you donate to us. We are there is nothing contentious about the work that we do other than some people might disagree with it. Even putting that aside, a few things, the RCMP has said that they did not freeze the accounts of anyone who donated to the convoy, only people who took participated in the convoy. Now, I know that that is debatable because I've spoken to a lot of people who say that their accounts were frozen following a donation. Um, but what the RCMP has said is that they did not give the names to any banks of any accounts to freeze other than people who were directly participating in the protests. Uh, putting that aside, though, you would not have your account frozen or monitored for donating to a registered Canadian charity like the Canadian Constitution Foundation that does uh, very high level legal work. So I want to set aside anyone's concerns about that. All of that said, we are we still think what happened in the convoy was incredibly wrong, and we are fighting for the rights of people who did experience account freezing so that it could not happen again, because it was appalling, terrible, terrible move by the government. Um, I just want to touch on a few other questions that were in here. Um, one question here is from Stacy about... Um, she says, will the ruling in favor of producing the unredacted copy of Lametti's opinion be something that can be used in your case? So there actually was no ruling at the commission to produce. I was going to say, that would be my dream. That would be my, uh, absolutely. So we have requested in court for this legal opinion. We obviously requested it directly from the prime minister at the inquiry. Our lawyer asked the prime minister, will you waive privilege on this? And, um, through his lawyer, he wouldn't even object to that himself. He, through his lawyer, uh, objected and said, no, we will not be waiving that privilege. But what we are arguing, this is the legal opinion that sets out this crazy Hail Mary argument that the government made, that the threshold for invoking the Emergencies Act is different from what the legislation actually says it is, and that Rulo accepted, even though he didn't get to see that legal opinion. So we have said in an adverse inference should be drawn from the government refusing to provide this and, and other material. So um, we have not seen that and we would have loved to, but we have not. Do you want to answer this uh, or I can talk about it? This is from Tim. If the federal court finds that the invocation of the EA was unjustified, what are the possible remedies a court could impose? So I'd say the most important effect of that is going to be obviously to some extent, a lot of what happened has happened, although presumably a finding that it was unjustified and unconstitutional would open up uh, a clear avenue to people who did suffer damages or suffer, suffer harm under the operation of the Emergencies Act to institute legal action. But to us, really, the most important thing is to have a judicial precedent saying that this was improper um, to guide any future government to provide some sort of guardrails against when it can be invoked. So really the precedent is what we're most concerned about in terms of the judicial finding. I don't know if you agree with that, Christine, or have any other comments? Uh, no, I think that that's right. Yeah. Particularly because it's the first time this is the, the act has been used, right? Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> This will probably be our last question because we're a little bit over time. We haven't really seen any significant wins for freedom from the courts for the recent issues. Any reasons why? This is something we talk about all the time. This is like, Joanna, did you submit this question? <laughs> no. 
I could have. Um, I can, I can, I'll, I'll say is I agree. And I think that the pandemic was a particularly bad time. It was a time when we just saw a tremendous amount of deference to the government. So yeah, I think we, we saw a huge amount of deference. They even took judicial notice of certain things like the efficacy of vaccines, which, um, I think it's not like judicial notice is when the court says this thing is so true that we don't need to even hear evidence about this. It would be like an example of something you would take judicial notice of is gravity exists. Like, you know, we all know that objects fall, so we don't need an expert to come and testify that um, gravity exists. But we saw family court decisions where the court said we can take judicial notice that vaccines are safe and work. And that's wild to me because this is a, a a new technology. It's something that experts have different opinions about. And like credible experts have different opinions about the efficacy of vaccines and the um, safety of giving them to young children. And that is crazy to me that the court would say this is so well established. It's the equivalent of gravity. So there was just way too much deference during this period. And I think it's a dangerous trend for the courts to be giving that much deference. Um, one case where there, there is a case that we're sort of involved in, uh, in Ontario that did find a violation of constitutional rights. It was a case where the Ford government wanted to require all teacher candidates to take a math test to be qualified as teachers. And the court struck that, um, that, down and said it's unconstitutional because of discrepancies along racial lines about the performance on standardized tests. So throughout the pandemic, no rights were violated except for the rights of teachers who need to know math to teach it to kids. Like it, it was a crazy period. And, and I was very unhappy during this period. I'm hoping now that we've moved past the pandemic and we're tying up loose strings related to pandemic related litigation, the pendulum is going to swing to be more balanced, but we're going to have to wait and see what happens. Okay. Thank you. And I put a link in the chat of a little piece that I wrote about that, about my, my, my mistaken views about what the charter would do for us, but it's important that we stay vigilant and it's important that we continue nipping at the government's heels. Um, eventually the tide will turn. Um, and we're fighting on a number of fronts um, and we can't give up. We simply can't. So um, final plug and Russell will also send out a follow-up email with this recording um, to invite you to become a member of our Freedom Insiders community. And we'll host regular town halls like this where um, we'll be able to answer your questions and we'll have um, intimate conversations and update you, give you the first uh, frontline information on our cases. Um, and you can tell us which cases you think are important. Um, there is the link to donate in the chat. Uh, but even if you don't donate, we really appreciate you spending um, an hour in the middle of the day on a Wednesday with us. Um, it's really important for us to hear from you and hear your questions. Thank you so much for your very thoughtful questions as always. Um, and we look forward to continuing to hear from you. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a great Wednesday, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, Bye. Everyone. Thank you.